of what would happen say if you move this before you were come to make the issue for issues. Um Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa, Koto Koto Koenua. I Kite Mihi Mahi here at Building Library, so I'm Vicky and I work here at Building Library and welcome to you all. Welcome to the festival. Um, you're this uh, here? Yeah. <laughs> cool. So, and in the red drop cover holes, and we will exit out the various exits. We'll either go out the back or the one kind of up the front there. Or if you need a convenient stop, the toilets are just um, here on the left. Um, there's two, they um, unisex, they just take whatever one is free. Um, coffee, tea, and water. Um, you help yourself. There's lovely Vickies. Um, that we are all festival, so just help yourselves. Um, and yeah, have a good, have a good festival. Um, if the fire alarm does go, that means we've done something really bad, so and we have to we have to get out. So grab your stuff, and we'll exit out there for those as well. The fire alarm. The fire alarm. Fire alarm. Sorry. Um, so I'd like to introduce Laura Jean Mackay and Dr. Colin York, um, and they will take you through this fantastic session. Um, we'll talk about your new book and the discoveries that she made. So that's good. Um, I'm sure you know this one. You're not, not leaving the mic for it. You're pretty I think I'll put it. Can everyone hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you can't just like just wave at me, and I, I will, I'll know that waving means uh, and if speak louder, calling. <laughs> if anybody's feeling uncomfortable, I do have um, masks here. If you would like to use those, I'll just leave them over here. Um, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. One minute. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to start. <laughs> yes. Yes. Get yourself. Get yourself settled. We'll start. We'll give it one or two minutes to let a few more people drop in. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, no mai, haere mai, uh, ki te Manawatu Writers Festival. This is the uh, first morning, I, I know there was an event last night. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Colin York, I'm uh, a lecturer in English and Media Studies at Massey University. Um, and I have the great fortune uh, to introduce and then interrogate uh, my <laughs> Uh, friend, colleague, and outstanding novelist, Laura Jean McKay. Uh, so by, um, I want to give you a, a brief uh, roadmap of what we're looking to do with our 90 minutes here. Um, I'll introduce her and her novel briefly, and that's wild enthusiasm. For <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after the introduction, then um, we want to start with a, a question and answer here first to kind of set context for the reading that she'll offer us later. And then we'll open it up to you all at the end um, for your own questions for the author. So um, by way of introduction, uh, 
just briefly, Laura Jean McKay is the author of Holiday in Cambodia, which was, uh, was that your first book? It was my first, first book. book. Shortlisted for three National Book Awards in Australia. And now, The Animals in That Country, which we learned recently is shortlisted for the Readings Prize. Uh, so, outstanding uh, work there. Um, Laura is a lecturer in creative writing at Massey University with a PhD from the University of Melbourne focusing on literary animal studies. She is also the animal expert on ABC's Listen, uh, ABC Listen's Animal Sound Safari. Uh, by way of introducing her book, uh, I want to read um, a short quote from author Sophie Cunningham, an Australian author who um, I know spoke at your book launch, and I want to read part of what she said because I thought it was so spectacular. Okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, Sophie Cunningham says, um, this novel is so many things that I don't quite know where to start. Laura's use of language is perhaps the best place. She builds a web of words. You find yourself caught in that web, and then webbing turns into a cocoon, and soon you forget there is a world outside of it. I literally gasped when I finished the novel. It was, to wildly mix my metaphors, like being dumped by a wave. That sense of total absorption, then bam, we're done. She also says, I can't finish without paying my respects to Laura's stylistic bravura. Um, at times, it's more poem than novel. Uh, the sometimes minimal words and phrases, phrases gesture at so many meaning, meanings. It is both dazzling and at times confounding. So, and this was this was your book launch was in the middle of the lockdown. Yep. So she, <laughs> yes. So she says, since you can't go to the beach for a while, um, read this, and you will feel dumped, held under, and it feels as if you've been washed up onto the sand left gulping for air by the end of it. Uh, she actually has lots more to say, and you can see the whole thing on her website and watch a video of it as well. Um, I also want, so in addition to Sophie Cunningham's um, kind of extolling of praise for this book, um, I also would like to turn to social media, because we know lots of reviews come through social media nowadays, whether we wanted to or not. And I thought one of the, I followed um, Laura Jean on, uh, on Twitter, and she posted something um, that someone had commented on Instagram that I thought was particularly apt. And this was back in the days of, I don't know if you, um, it seems like a million years ago, but just a few months ago, it was like the Tiger King cultural moment. Uh, and someone said on social media that uh, Laura's protagonist, Jean, her human protagonist, uh, reminded this, uh, this author of as if Laura Jean was, a, was the love child of Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin, <laughs> all in one. Uh, so I think that's an apt way of, uh, of describing your, your main it's character. The best review I've ever had. <laughs> Sometimes social media does a good thing. Not all the time, but every once in a while. Uh, and then just uh, briefly before we get into the question and answer, uh, my own few thoughts on this book. Um, I come from. Texas, as you might can tell, or can see. Um, and so uh, immediately when I was reading this, it reminded me of um, Cormac McCarthy's writing, Desert Southwest in the United States, both in like the incisiveness of your prose, and also like this devastating look at humanity and the animality of humanity. But um, the way that I think you go well beyond what Cormac McCarthy does is your, your dedication to the non-human world in the way that, um, like, the way that you represent uh, human or the human and animal relations in a way that is nuanced and resists anthropomorphizing animals in a way that makes us feel good about ourselves and instead asks us to listen to what they have to say. I think there's lots of talk in this book about like what do the animals say, and this is, and, and we'll talk later about how she how you got into the voicing of the animals. But for me, it just reminded me that we need to listen more to the non-human world, um, and I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Colin. Hello, Coco. Now, my, my, my. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you, Colin, for such a generous um, opening to this event. It's really, um, Colin called me up um, one night and um, basically interviewed me about <laughs> the animals in the country. So when this event came up, I knew the person that I wanted to join me on the stage was you. So, 
well, I have to say it floored me. I, um, I've only been at Massey for a year. Actually, we started at the we same time. The same time yeah. uh, and as a, as, a, as a lifelong reader, I've always dreamed of the day when I could be in an English department and, and interview, sit next door to creative writers right down the hallway and then get to interview them. And this is my first time, actually. <laughs> and I was pretty much floored by your novel. I read it. I haven't. Can, I think I told you on the phone. I can't remember the last time I read a book in 24 hours. I'm a horribly slow reader. And the only thing that kept me from doing it all in one day is that I started at like seven o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, let's start with some questions. Um, the only uh, beef that I have with, with people who write reviews, this is not beef with you, it's people who write reviews of your books, is that they um, oftentimes go first to your human protagonist, Gene. But uh, this book is as much, it seems to me, about um, your animal protagonist, Sue the dingo, a dingo called Sue. Um, no relation to the Johnny Cash song, I think, uh, by the way, <laughs> um, Sue. But I wanted to ask you um, about, uh, if you could tell us about dingo named Sue and kind of thinking your way into um, an animal protagonist like that. Mm, thank you for starting with the animal, but um, I mean, that's, I suppose, what I started with when I was coming to this book. Uh, I guess I want to preempt this by talking about dingoes for a moment because um, in Australia, if I mention a dingo, we have all of these cultural associations. The dingo holds a very intense place in Australian identity. Um, dingoes arrived in Australia around 6,000 years ago, so that predates colonization, but very, very much um, post-dates um, indigenous, um, you know, uh, cultural experience and on, on the land. And so is the dingo a native animal or is the dingo introduced, um, is, uh, is the dingo a pet for some people it is, or is the dingo wild? Are they feral? Um, a lot of people like to kill them because they tend to eat the sheep, they really like the sheep. Uh, and so there's all these sort of different associations, but I'm realizing when I'm speaking in New Zealand or to Americans, a dingo probably seems a bit like a dog. So I suppose I would almost relate a dingo to a wolf um, in, that, in that sort of wildness that they have, um, in that sort of strange beauty. They howl, their howls, um, you know, carry through uh, the dusk every night if you're in dingo territory. There's this very, very haunting sound. And um, if you like to YouTube things, you can spend many a happy hour looking up dingoes and listening to their sound and then discovering the Indonesian um, singing dingoes who, who have sort of these, these different songs. So um, for me, the dingo was a really important character to include in the book, just to sort of look at the, the slightly uneasy space that we have uh, with other animals. But having said that, Sue just arrived as well. So. You know, as an author, and a lot of you would, would know this um, if you write, but, but also um, if you're a passionate reader, you'll know that some characters are, are sort of made and, and the author will have really, you know, take a long time to craft them. And when we talk about Jean, I can talk about how long it took to find the human Jean, the, the person who tells this story. Um, but Sue just arrived on page. I was living in a wildlife park for a little while in the Northern Territory. Of Australia, which is like I'm from Victoria, the cold sort of um, cityish place, and the Northern Territory is like an, another country, it's, a, it's another planet. It's hot, um, there's guns, there's hunting, people are wild um, and loud. It's very, it's almost as though the Northern Territory is in oil paints while Victoria is in pastels. So, I'm up there in oil paint country, um, or maybe ochre if, if we're looking um, at the incredible. Indigenous art that is up there. Um, and so I'm living in this wildlife park, and, and there are these three dingoes um, who were uh, in one of the enclosures there, and I could hear them howling, and then the wild dingoes on the other side outside howling back. So they would sort of call to each other through the evening. And I suppose that just infiltrated my book, and this dingo Sue just arrived one day, and once she arrived on the page, everything made sense. The main character, Jean, had a purpose. Um, she had what starts out as a sidekick who ends up becoming increasingly important and then almost dominating her life as the book goes on. Um, and in a way, 
I don't know, and I, I know that I should say this being a writer, but I don't know that I ever really completely got to know Sue as a character, and, and I almost wanted to leave that mystery in there. I feel like I could keep writing about Sue forever. Um, she's a little bit of an enigma. She has her wild self and her, and her uh, captive self. And when she starts to talk, because that's what happens in this novel, the animals do start to speak or, or communicate or humans can understand what they're saying. She's constantly having these sort of um, battles with herself. So, um, you know, she will say things like, I love you. No, I don't. You know, so she's sort of got this, this um, angel devil dingo, this wild and, and captive dingo thing happening. She wants to be, at the same time, she wants to be held and on a lead and patted and kept and fed and at the very same time she wants to be out and finding her pack and running wild with the other dingoes and there's that constant um, sort of incarcerated state I suppose she's institutionalized but she still has that deep wild and that's certainly came from my time in the wildlife park as well there was a, a dingo who was separate from from the other pack he sort of seemed to be on a lead and like this is just like this gorgeous big sandy dog and of course, I just want to go. Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the the guides just kept saying to me, "This is a wild animal. Um, you know, she will she will love you, and she'll lick you on the face, and she'll sit next to you panting, and then she will turn and bite your ear off. You know, you, you do not, you will never ever know what she's going to do truly because you're not wild. You don't understand." Um, and I loved that. I loved, I loved being around the canine um, who also had this other side of her that I would never ever get to know. And that was what I tried to represent uh, in the characterization. Which is scary too. It's scary writing a character that you will never really truly get to know because there's a lack of control. And writers, we want control. That's, a, that's why we write in a way. Like we, we're creating these worlds, especially fiction writers. What control freaks? We're creating these worlds. Um, and, you know, we want it all to sort of go a certain way. We know the readers will read it the way they will, but we control so much. So to have a character in there who's just, you know, doing her own thing is a little bit terrifying. Um, and so it's interesting because I rarely get asked about Sue, which is funny, or, or especially not first up. And so I'm tell I'm quite excited about, you know, about that yeah. being the opening. Um, yeah, because she's the one who, I guess, as a writer, you ask me the most. And if we can get that to her, then I'll see. Sure. You mentioned the word wild a few times just now, and the term pops up in the book. Uh, <laughs> quite a bit as well uh, and also this like this tension between is the dingo domesticated or wild and also to what extent is the wild part of the human versus the kind of animalian and the domesticated aspect of human I'm curious how you thought about wild and wildness in the animal human relations in this that you depict in this book mm. uh, my editor um, got back to me on one of the early edits and said you mentioned the word wild about 10 times in the first few pages. So why don't we just start by cutting that down a little. <laughs> and the, the opening words um, in the novel are, you can see the wild in her. Um, so that, that, was, that was certainly something that I was, I was playing with, I suppose, as a, as a major theme. Uh, and when it comes to, so I've already explained how, you know, Sue constantly goes between those two states. I suppose as humans, we don't really think of ourselves as wild, um, even though I guess there's arguments around that, like is, is this our sort of wild place, all this constructed stuff? Um, but I, I don't think we would, we would necessarily think of ourselves in that way. Uh, there's a woman called Jean who tells the novel, it's, it's told in, in her first person voice. Uh, and I mean, she's a bit of a wild character. She loves a drink. Um, she loves to smoke. She just loves it. Um, she she likes to drive. She doesn't really like people. She loves animals. Um, so I suppose she has a sort of a pretty wild nature anyway. Uh, but as the book progresses and as she starts to get sicker and sicker and understand different sorts of animals, first it's the mammals, then she understands the birds, and finally the insects, which, which really puts her over the edge. Um, 
she starts to lose her own language in a way, and it was very purposefully sort of constructed that at the beginning of the novel she just talks and talks and talks. And as she goes on, in a way, her dialogue becomes a bit more spare and a bit less, and she becomes a bit quieter as she starts to listen to these other speakers who also have things to say. Uh, so I suppose, I suppose that was the way I was trying to look at our animality. Um, it's definitely not a metamorphosis book. Um, Jean doesn't turn into a dingo, even though she tries to start um, eating the weird things that Sue <laughs> decides to give her. Uh, you know, she has to start to live the life, uh, this life with a dingo. She's not, she's not really changing, and in a way she refuses to change her whole thing. Um, you know, where it becomes very difficult. Yeah, where her humanness sort of over, starts to override. So uh, I want to ask another question about the animals that you're reminding me of when you're talking about the language. Um, and to kind of frame this, you know, one of the uh, uh, kind of constructs of the book is that there's this pandemic going on, right? It's much has been made of Laura releasing her book about a pandemic into a pandemic. And the way that this pandemic works in your book um, is that when uh, people catch this this disease, this virus, um, they begin to hear animals speak. And it's slowly, it's not all at once. Uh, it's first, as you said, the mammals, and then other uh, than birds, and then, it's, and then just all of a sudden voices everywhere. All the whole non-human world, the animal world speaking to you, um, which has, which is overwhelming. It has lots of effects on people. But I, I was taken, so there are so many animals in this book, especially for someone who has never been to Australia before. They're from uh, these crazy mammals that fly and look like raccoons whose names I don't even know, to crocodiles, to... Um, they're just bats. They're bats. <laughs> <laughs> it's like these, I don't know, long bat-like things. There are just all these animals in this book. And then, but there are also the domesticated animals, the, the pigs on the way to slaughter, the cows stuck in the dairy farm, um, the whales, uh, the, and then the mosquitoes buzzing around your ear not non-stop. And so my question to you is sort of, well, she gives voice to all of these animals at different points in the novel. How in the world did you think through the voices of these thousands of different creatures mm. as a writer? What, how did you do that? Yeah, um, there was, there was, there were, this novel took seven years to write and and the way that I write, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. I don't, I don't teach this at Massey. <laughs> um, I write the worst first draft that has ever been written, and then I will show it to a few people, um, and then they say that's awful. And then I go back and I try to, because I can see what I want, but I, I take a long time to get there. And I go back and rewrite it, or completely rewrite it, and rewrite it. You know, and so I would say, you know, a complete rewrite absolutely from scratch, you know, three times, I would say, not to mention all of the other drafts. So anyway, I showed one of these early drafts um, to my partner, who is speaking up the other end right now, Tom <laughs> um, and he said, look, you know, I can really see there's something, he didn't say it was awful, um, but he said, I can see there's something in there, um, but your talking animal book doesn't have any talking animals in it, so, you know, <laughs> maybe you want to address that. <laughs> And I realised I was doing my PhD at the time, and so you're doing sort of a lot of research and overthinking everything. And I realised I just had this horror of anthropomorphism. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, um, you know, place our humanness onto other animals. That's a terrible thing to do. But the more I read, the more I realised maybe that's not so bad. And I read this wonderful piece by Jane Goodall, who said um, when she went into the to the jungles of Tanzania. Um, she was looking at these these creatures who are so close in DNA to us, these chimpanzees, and she would write these reports saying, um, you know, um, you know, Bonzo was, you know, seemed angry today. He stole, you know, all the leaves from from um, Judas, and and you know, she'd use language like stole and um, anger, and and she would sort of personify them. And the scientists just absolutely bagged her. They said, you're not a real scientist. You know, you shouldn't even be in this job. Uh, of course, she's Jane Goodall. <laughs> you know, now we know. You know, this young woman was actually changing the face of the way that we that we look and relate to animals and these animals that are extremely close to us. And so um, I realised that I just needed to get over myself. Um, also, that humans uh, we think we're so great, but we're actually so limited. 
the way that we communicate is extremely limited. We're so focused on language um, and, and what we can see. And we ignore, of course, all of the other things like body language and smell and, and all those other wonderful things that are actually happening. And when I was looking at, at things like um, you know, our, our domestic dog who has an entire center in their brain that is there to process smell. It's this giant, you know, their heads are sort of shaped like this. Here is this incredible scent processing center. Um, and they can smell things that we couldn't even comprehend. Um, and that, to me, is intelligence. That's, that's a physical intelligence that we just don't have. So I thought, okay, humans are pretty limited. Um, we, we, we see the world in a, in a fairly limited way. So maybe I should just celebrate these other animal traits on the page. Maybe that's my way to find my way into a common language. And so with this flu, people can't, the animal's lips aren't talking. <laughs> you know, there's not, not a mosquito with a little mouth <laughs> moving. <laughs> uh, uh, what happens is that one of the, just like, you know, the pandemic we're experiencing, except one of the side effects is that we can start to um, understand what animal bodies, what their scent, um, uh, what their movement and their incredible abilities are saying, what they're saying with their bodies. So a wag and a flick of an ear and a smell from a bottom and a, you know, a twitchy paw will all come together and, and make sentences and make words. But I was still really struggling with that. I had the sort of concept there, but how was I going to put it on the page? Um, and what really helped me and my, what really sort of helped me to find my way in was insects. Um, <laughs> so uh, I thought, yeah, that's right. I thought, what is an insect doing? You know, when they're when they're going when they're going about their business, and I thought they seem so joyful. Wouldn't they just be screaming, just yelling themselves uh, um, across the room? You know, they sort of fling. <laughs> uh, and so I I capitalised this insect language on the page. Um, some people find it quite terrifying because the book being able to understand insects would, would drive us bananas. We, you know, we, that's the point that would be breaking, a breaking point for most people. Uh, but for me, their language is, is very joyous, it's loud, um, they, they celebrate, they love landing on people, they love sweat, they love blood, you know, and once I had insects, I thought, well, if I can write a mosquito talking, then maybe I can write a dingo, maybe I can write a cow, maybe I can write a bird. Uh, and from there, I started to really play with font. So the insects are all capitalized. The birds have this sort of um, slightly sarcastic, italicized nuance. And Sue, in particular, um, does have these curly mysteries where she's always on the wrong side. Um, but then there was all this work to do on the language. I, um, I used Google Translate a lot. I really liked to write these sort of, I wouldn't even call them poems, they're almost like song lyrics. Um, I would actually write songs, and I'm, I can't sing or play piano, but I would go and write these weird animal songs, take the lyrics, put them through Google Translate, um, translate them into Latin especially, um, because you get this really unusual, and also Finnish, which is quite different to English, um, and sometimes Japanese, and, and sort of put them through these, and you get this beautiful sort of um, internet poetry, and I'd just start to sort of construct things from there. But the an animal language came quite late in a way, and I was still working on it right up back to beginning as well. Um, I had a two hour, I did a two hour debate with my editor um, because she was like, I like the animal language, keep it as it is. And I sort of stood up and said, dialogue is so important. And you know, we need to privilege the human dialogue and the animal dialogue as well. And why should the animals suffer? And um, so, <laughs> so we had this sort of really passionate um, exchange about dialogue. And she was a huge advocate of never making the animal dialogue too easy, um, of, of not allowing the animals to um, prophesize or be too poetic or give us the answers to our basic human questions. Um, there are so many books, and, th and that's fine, it's a lovely avenue, but there are a lot of books with animals in them where the animal has the key to the world, the, the classic, um, which I love, Douglas Adams series. Um, uh, the restaurant of the universe, but the first one was um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where the dolphins, um, you know, have the answer to the universe. Uh, 
uh, and then the humans realize they don't actually, the answer is 42 and the humans realize they don't know the question. <laughs> um, and so, and that is really wonderful that I wanted these animals in here to have their own lives apart from the human characters and be doing their own things and to exist apart from our overwhelming human nature. And so that was part of the creation of the dialogue as well. It is often called poetry though. Um, yeah, it's an interesting I, I appreciated how we did. I think the way that you said it wasn't easy to, you resisted the temptation to make the animal's language easy for us. And I think I, I could sense the limitations of our human ways of communicating in reading this because we are so visual and aural uh, in the way, but we, in the way that we often communicate as humans, but um, the way that you bring to life all the movements, the embodiments um, is rich and kind of helped me realize how what a challenge for a writer to try to bring that way, human or animal way of communicating to the human world, which highlights our limitations. Um, another challenge, in addition to visualizing that language and giving it voice on the page, is when you had to give it voice on your audio book. <laughs> How in the world did you voice so many different animals all by yourself in the studio? How did yes. that work? <laughs> um, so I was asked very, very late in the piece. The audio book got um, got commissioned, so it's sort of a, a separate thing. It's like getting a separate contract. And I said, "Great, I want to read it." And they said, "No, we're getting a proper actor." And I said, "Come on!" <laughs> and um, I had to audition, and they said, "All right." The only reason we're, we're letting you do it is because we can't find an actor who will do all these animals. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you're okay, you're fine. <laughs> Your audition was fine, but you know, we just can't find this person. So um, I was very busy. It had to happen very quickly. Um, COVID was starting to, to spread around the world, but it still wasn't a thing down here much yet, or, or in Australia, you know, there were cases. So I shot over to Sydney wearing a face mask and being heckled on the plane um, from Harvester Was this Hall. February? February. Yeah. So, yeah, I hear people talking about me. Like, just wearing a face mask, that's a bit weird. Um, <laughs> little did we know. Uh, and so I get over there um, for Sydney, and I've been so busy I hadn't had the chance to work out how all the animals were going to speak. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on the phone to Tom the night before saying, I have to talk like a horse tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> And if I get it wrong, we will have to record it all again, you know, because it was four days straight of, of reading. And he said, well, why don't you think about, um, you know, the physicality, you know, and, and use of sort of um, clowning skills. We used to do clowning together. <laughs> so I started manipulating my face, and so I'd just go into the studio every morning, and I'd be like, right, because I didn't want the animals to be like, a dog like being a rosy and a cat, you know that. You know, people always make cats slightly um, sort of sexy and and evil. Like you know, <laughs> you get that cat voice. So I wanted to avoid all of that. Or I just want a mooey voice of the cow. So I was really manipulating my face. So you know, one creature had like a bit of a thing like this, and then I was, you know, I had a look at what. Lipstick on myself, <laughs> and then you'll see later when I read. Um, you know, Sue has a very smiling voice, and the and the mice sort of pant, and then the insects would scream. Uh, so it was. I, I wish I could say I was more professional about it, but it was literally me staying. You know, getting up. I'd set my alarm for four or five a.m. and then practice my face in the hotel room, and then go in there and, and pretend that I was a practice voice actor and, and do it. But that was such an amazing way. If anybody ever gets the chance to to sort of read their work in quite a dramatic way rather than than just a, a straight reading, it's such an amazing way to engage with something that you've written because suddenly. This animal language wasn't just something abstract that I had on the page and in my imagination and that I was trying to put in the reader's head. It was actually something that I physically had to had to work out. And in a way, the off-the-cuff, um, last-minute way that I did it was perhaps the only way because I'd over-report it. I don't know, maybe, maybe it wouldn't have worked. Maybe it would be better. <laughs> we'll never know. It, 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 could, it could feel too canned, right, if you overthought it. Yeah, I like that. Mm. Improvisational clowning in a way. Yeah, yeah. So I've got these photos of me in the studio with my cheek stretched out <laughs> to here. And <laughs> yeah, it was it was such an amazing experience. I'm so glad I did it. Um, 
but yeah, four days of, of reading their own work. And of course, then you pick up bits. It's published, and you pick up a few lines in there, and think, oh, I could do with that. <laughs> nothing you can do with that. <laughs> um, can I ask you now about? I want to. I want to eventually get to Gene, but right before we get to Gene, we've, we've been talking, circling around the different kinds of research you've done for this project, both up at the Wildlife Park, um, your ways of thinking through your PhD program into the, the theoretical lens of the animals. Um, what other, tell us more about the research you did for this book, the Wildlife Park, but also I understand you went to the United States as well. Yeah, yeah, I did go to the States. Um, it was very early on in the writing of the book. At the time, it was a bad draft. I uh, was set on a farm. The main character was called Judy. She was not very interesting, <laughs> and there were no talking animals. Um, and I got this incredible sort of travelling grant um, to sort of go and just really spend some time with actual animals to get out of out of my books. I went up to the wildlife park, but I also went over to the states uh, and um, sort of infiltrated this incredible sanctuary for chimpanzees and orangutans. And it's not open to the public, but I managed to get a viewing. And what happens when you walk in there, it's the Centre for Great Lakes in Florida. I've never been to the States, first time ever, and I, I walk into this, this chimpanzee sanctuary. And um, in a way, you become the, the enclosed creatures and, and the chimpanzees and the orangutans, which is their territory. So there's a series of enclosures, and they absolutely surround you. And it's like being, um, what I imagine, it's like, like being walking into um, a really sort of intense environment, like um, it's like a basketball game or a, or a prison. There are there are chimpanzees sort of hanging off these enclosures, heckling you and calling out and trying to get your attention, blowing kisses, and you know slightly harassing you. And it's just the most amazing experience. And I, all of these chimpanzees as well who are in this enclosure, are ex Hollywood stars or ex TV stars or ex um, show chimpanzees and orangutans. So the orangutan that appears on Seinfeld, Dunstan's Day Out or something. Um, basically, every chimpanzee that you've ever seen in an 80s or 90s movie would be housed here because once they grow up, with their little in the movies and then suddenly they turn into these very big, powerful creatures um, and Hollywood doesn't know what to do with them, so they send them off to laboratories and all sorts of things. And this woman, um, brings them back in. So I ended up in an enclosure staring at Bubbles, who is uh, Michael Jackson's old um, companion. Um, and he is a very traumatized chimpanzee. He, um, as soon as you pick up a camera, he um, will find the closest bit of poo or, <laughs> or you know, a rock and he can aim it right at your lens. He's really anti -pathology. Uh It was just the most amazing experience. Uh, and Bubbles is um, a flatmate, I guess, or enclosure mate, best friend is called um, Ripley. And I had this really weird experience um, when I came face to face with Ripley. So I'm just sort of there with my notebook doing my thing. And I just looked up and saw this chimpanzee looking at me. And it was like, you know, sometimes you meet people and you realize that they're going to be your friend. You just go, oh, you seem cool. Like, there's something about you that's, you know. That's really interesting, and I want to get to know you more. It was just like that. I felt like I was looking at a friend, and yet, and his hands, chimpanzee hands, are so like ours. They're, you know, they're, they're uncannily similar, and yet he was a completely different species. We couldn't speak to each other, and we. I just had this moment of thinking, if we, can, I can make this connection across sort of millennia of, of, of difference. Um, maybe I can start to draw those connections in the book. And so Ripley is in here, there actually are any chimpanzees in the novel, but every human and animal interaction is that moment for me, that moment of looking at this hairy face and, and thinking, I know you, but you're so different. Yeah. Mm, powerful experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe now we can transition to the humans. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I kind of like hanging with the animals, but you know, people want to hear the uh, the story of the your human protagonist, Jean, the drinking, smoking, swearing, a bit wilder self uh, grandmother uh, who works at the wildlife park, ends up catching this pandemic flu, um, hearing the animals speak slowly, and then goes on this journey to chase after her grandchild who's been 
abducted by her son. <laughs> it's it's a complex family room. <laughs> story. Christmas is difficult. <laughs> uh, but I, the thing that struck me about Jean is this character's name is I I kept on rooting for her even though she kept letting me down every chapter. <laughs> she disappointed me, and I wanted her to be better, to be a better human being. But I kept like I just kept rooting. I kept thinking that she was going to figure it out. I was still in her corner um, every chapter through the book. So how, I'm, I'm not a creative writer. I don't know craft like this. How in the world do you create a character like that that your readers root for but still is so desperately flawed? Mm. <laughs> she took so long to, it took me so long to find Jean. She was just, she was really hiding. Um, and I mean, it was, I mean, I was very dogged about it. I obviously thought there was something in this novel because I, I couldn't let it go. And I wrote about 80,000 words of this um, terrible sort of farm novel. <laughs> um, at one point, Jean was a cat uh, for not very long, but for, you know, a few thousand different words. Um, she was also a young woman who worked in the laboratory for a while. And then for quite a bit, she was just a man, a middle-aged man who just sat on a couch. And I really couldn't get him moving. He just, he was really lazy. <laughs> and uh, I I became very thick at the, at the beginning of writing this novel. I'd, I'd gone over to Bali, which is lovely for a writer's festival. And I was bitten by a mosquito um, who gave me a disease that they call dengue on crack. It's sort of this, it's called chicken glue, and that's it. I mean, it completely, you just can't move. You have the whole polyarthritis. And I had it for about two years. And at one point, I um, I just really felt like I was turning into a mosquito. I was, you know, I was delirious. My skin peeled off. Um, it was it was a really intense um, time. And that illness started to really sort of infect the novel. And it also really started to infect Jean. Um, so I was pretty much bedridden. Um, I was trying to write, but my hands, my fingers felt broken. So I did a lot of reading. Uh, and I read a short story by Otisa Moshfe. Um, if you haven't come across her work, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, everyone knows about her now, but at the time I thought I was, I was discovering her. <laughs> um, read a short story about this, um, this drunken school teacher who just keeps, who's really passionate about teaching her students, but she's absolutely smashed the whole time. <laughs> so much so that she ends up sleeping in the, in the classroom. Um, and I thought, wow, like what, how beautiful to have a character who is so out of control and yet still exists in the world. And, um, you know, aren't we all trying to do that in a certain sense, even if we don't, um, I mean, I can't drink anymore, so maybe I was sort of, <laughs> you know, um, interested in how much she could drink when, when I can't really. Um, and yeah, I just I just thought that that lack of control um, in a controlled environment was something that I really wanted to find. Uh, and to get a bit closer to her, I just used a bit of a writer retreat was just to give your character one of your names or a name that you really love or a name that you really hate to try and you know get a bit closer. And I thought I'll just give her the name Jean, my middle name. I've always liked that name. And then later on in a few drafts, I'll take it out and call her something else. That'll be fine. And I just gave this character this name, and as soon as she was Jean, she was just ran. She just went for it, and suddenly I just had this, you know, completely rewrite wrote the novel. Had this experience in the wildlife park, and spent much of the first part of the novel there. Um, and so once I found her, um, the novel really took off. But my God, it took it took a few years, and it took hundreds of thousands of words. Um, and I am a real character writer, like I write for character and that's the way I find my way into work. Uh, and so I suppose that's why I kept going with it. Most, it would have been advisable for me to drop it <laughs> and, <laughs> and go on and do something else just because it took so long and it was really, it was a really hard novel to get to. Uh, but I knew that if I could find a woman um, who was strong enough to carry this Apocalypse, this animal apocalypse that that the novel would, would I could carry it off. I'm glad you didn't quit. Yeah, yeah, so and good. I, yeah. 
And another thing was um, making her, she's, you know, um, she's a 52-year-old woman, and that was very, very purposeful. Um, and I got a bit of pushback from readers. They were like, you know, most sort of speculative fiction, you know, it needs to be young. Sort of. And I was like, what? who is stronger than a middle-aged woman? Like, she's, um, you know, she's tough. Um, she's, um, you know, she's, she looks different to the way she used to look before. Um, you know, she's sort of embracing this sort of aging body, um, but she's energetic and strong. Um, yeah, so I knew that if anybody could carry it, yeah. <laughs> And it took me so long that now I'm a middle-aged woman and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Jean is, Jean is so compelling. Uh, can you tell us, I think I might know the answer to this question, but I'm curious what your favorite kind of scene is in the novel and then kind of maybe how you uh both how you crafted that scene and why it's so important to you that's such a good question i've never been asked that before thank you <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it's the one i can guess it <laughs> <laughs> yeah um there is a scene that came very early and it was it was present in those in those early um bad drafts um and it's a scene, I call it the whale scene, I suppose. Um, and if you read the novel, you'll, you'll come to it. I suppose, in a way, it's, it's the climax of the novel, although there's a, there's a lot more that comes after. Um, and I won't talk about the specific plot aspects because I don't have that many tips, so I need to, you know, <laughs> retain the ones that I do. Um, but basically, um, the entire novel sort of points towards this whale scene, which is a scene where the whales come into this bay and they're breaching, and as they breach, the humans can hear, can understand what they're saying. And of course, you know, what what better animal to understand than a whale? They're these giant, you know, almost mystical mammals who live in the ocean. Uh, and so when people uh, start to hear the whales, they want to be with them. And so there's this mass scene where people are just entering the water and, and drowning themselves accidentally because they're trying to get down to eat the whale. Uh, and part of the dialogue uh, from the whale scene is some of my favourite uh, because I I read some scientific discussion about how um, you know, millions of years ago whales left the ocean and and you know sort of very different looking form but it was the ancestor of the whale left the ocean and came onto the land and sort of um, stumped around a bit for, um, I guess, a few millennia, um, and then sort of, I guess, decided that it wasn't so great on land, and it was way better back in the ocean, and they might just sort of evolve and, and return back. So they, in a way, they made an evolutionary decision. They tried it out here, not as good, let's go back into the ocean. And so when they're in the water, when they breach, the whales in the novel are saying to the humans, come home. Um, why don't you come home? It's better here. You know, we've tried it up there. Why don't you? Why don't you come back? The whales don't realise that the humans haven't evolved. We're limited <laughs> um, to be under the water, and so the humans are hearing this voice saying, "Come home. Like, come, come back. I'm, I've got everything ready. The bed's made. You know, come back in." And the humans are just throwing themselves in the water and drowning. And, and Jean um, arrives at this end to find that her son and her <laughs> that was the scene I guessed that might have been your yeah, favorite. Yeah. And and that came that came very, very early in the writing. Um and there was sort of this quite complete scene that actually didn't change too much in the in the you know, in sort of five or six years probably. And then but when you have a scene like that, you need to make the rest of the novel sort of work as well and um, and build and pull away from that. So uh, in a way that was the it's, yeah, it's a siren song those whales are singing, and it just calls. It, yeah, it seems like the whole novel is working in that direction. I can see it now from the. Yeah. Now you mentioned you wrote, wrote that first. That's a great way to put it, and I guess it was a siren song to me as a writer as well. Mm -hmm. I was very, very lucky to have that scene in the novel. I didn't even ever finish the novel. I knew what it might be. Maybe. Uh, one more question about maybe a craft question about your language, uh, which is just uh, poetic, sharp, cutting. It's, it's, it's terrific. My, um, you, you sort of mentioned a little earlier about how Jean's language, this first person 
uh, mostly present tense kind of novel. I'm curious, one, why, why those choices? But then two, you alluded earlier to how Jean's language herself um, kind of starts out super wordy, verbose as can be, and begins to, to shorten as she goes through the novel. Um, so tell us about those kind of writerly choices uh, of the language. Of the book. Yeah, I mean, in a way, and, and again, people who write will know this, um, I feel like every story has, um, it sort of calls out to be, you know, in third person or the, or the first person, and, and it calls to have a certain character whose, whose story is and often is to find that, and we can have text coming from the mouth and the words to do that. Um, but it was a very conscious choice. Uh, once I had Jean, I knew that it was a she who was speaking, she, she needed to, um, Embody the voice of the novel, so it was first person. I wanted it to be quite immediate, uh, so it's in present tense. But one of the more difficult craft elements was the fact that I wanted her to be very, very present uh, and be very, very present with other animal characters. I think that our relationship with other animals is very present when, when you're with the dog, when you're with the companion animal, when you see, um, you know, uh, an incredible bird in the wild, um, suddenly you're very, very much there with them and it seems that they're very much with you and there's this tension in that moment, especially in a wild encounter where you stare at each other and wonder what the other is going to do. Uh, so I wanted to keep that sense of presence. Uh, and so there, are, there aren't really any flashbacks in the novel. Um, there are some memory moments. There are some moments where, where Jean will remember something, but it's not really a flashback. I don't ever take you back into the scene. It stays very much with Jean and her memory. Uh, and that was that was actually very, very hard to do. It's hard to write an entire novel in the present tense, staying in the moment, um, and to build a full character with a past life that started before the novel without, without flashbacks. Um, so, in a way, that was part of the, the mental draft and the, and the novel not working for some time because that was quite a difficult, difficult thing to maintain. Was and it I, always present tense? Or did it, it was change? always present tense. Okay. Oh, I, I don't know about you know, the early versions where Jean was other than the cat. The cat might have been past tense <laughs> with an evil voice. Um, yeah, but, but once it was Jean, it was very much here. Um, and there were some readers who would say, you know, you need to, why don't you just pop a flashback in the end of the book? Let's just make it easier. And I would say that to people too. Um, in my early book, their work, you know, just pop in a flashback. Mm -hmm. But I was so, but I would really fight to find another way around that. How can I get to this character? How can I reveal her full self without um, going to that past too much? Uh, so that was quite fun and quite frustrating. Mm. <laughs> Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it does feel like a very present book. We, and that's part of, I think, the, the challenge for Jean as a protagonist and us as a reader is to be so present with these animals who are, who are saying things that we may not always want to hear what they're saying, what they have to say. And, and you, your prose forces us to be present with them, forces us to listen. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my <laughs> I, I'm reminded now about uh, one of the things you said to me on the phone when, we, when I called you up during lockdown after having re read this. Um, I, I said, thank you for not letting us humans off the hook with this book. Like, sh you, you held our feet over the fire and never gave us a kind of rest. And again, in, in a way that like, not in a... You didn't, it wasn't, you didn't torture the reader, okay? <laughs> she didn't torture you as a reader. But she help, holds us accountable, I think, as readers. Um, and you said to me, um, well, Colin, I, as humans, we sort of always choose ourselves, don't we? Um, I wonder, can you can you speak to that idea of like humans choosing themselves a little bit by way of leading into your reading, maybe? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think we think that we do, and we like to hope that we are better than we are. But our relationship with um, the with other species, our relationship with the environment, and what we do to it, um, I think it shows us that that we are very uh, self-centered. We are very focused on ourselves. I mean, that's been that's been the triumph of um, of human culture, especially in the twentieth century. Is um, idea of the individual, the idea of the wonder of the human mind, 
um, this idea that we can, if we try hard enough, we can, you know, that's all capitalism and, the, and neoliberalism as well. If we try hard enough, we can achieve anything. Um, we teach, we tell our children this, um, that, you know, if you, if you try, if you, if you do this, you can be anything. Um, something really strikes me about um, something that Greta Thunberg, the, um, Thunberg? Thunberg? Thunberg. Um, the, the climate activist uh, said recently, uh, she said, you told us that we could be anything and we could do anything and you lied. You lied to us. We can't. There is not a future. The future that you said that we, would, yeah. we would have doesn't exist anymore. You know, that's not fair. How could you say that? And I suppose, um, even though I wasn't writing to that, she said it <laughs> the last year or so, I suppose, um, in a way, this book is sort of a love letter to um, you know, to a, a future that will never be. It's this, it's this letter to this, this exchange and this connection with, um, with other animals that we will never actually get. We don't have a share of it. And so, um, what will we do um, if we had a shared language? If they, they get a shared language in the book and they still don't take that chance to make things better um, for other animals. So if they don't do it, then, then what can we do? What hope do we have um, of, of connecting with this world that we live in and, for, and to save this you know, environment, environment that is rapidly, rapidly changing if we, if we can't connect? We have to just try and get harder. Um, you know, with humans, I think. <laughs> if we can be a little bit less bad, <laughs> that would actually do a lot for the world. Not even being good. We can't be good. Not, <laughs> we don't do that, but can we be a bit less bad? Um, <laughs> it's a big isn't it? <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's appropriate for us to hear. Yeah. But um, I, don't, I mean, I think I am quite a cynical person, but um, I surprise myself because I think there is, there is a, an element of hope in the book, like I am, it is a love letter. I am, I am wishing that, that we could be better and, and that we could have that connection. So maybe it's not hope. That word's a little, a little funny and a little contentious now. Maybe it's just wishful thinking, dreaming, <laughs> wanting. <laughs> I like it as a love letter. I hadn't thought of it as a love letter to that idea. But, um, yeah. Um, would you want to read a bit sure. for us? Uh, can I ask real quick while she's? Um, Finding her spot. Uh, can you still hear us? I know there's a little bit more. You can hear okay. Come on. Okay. Um, we have our we have our um, broad foreign accents. We yes. Loud voices. That's right. We're from loud cultures. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Uh, okay. Um, and then there'll be a question and answer time from the audience after the reading. What's the, the part are you reading from? I think you're reading from, from chapter six. Um, I was just going to say that um, I suppose, you know, the Kiwi and Australian accents are fairly similar. And when I arrived here, I just thought that I, I sounded Kiwi. I've only been for a year. But every now and then I'll say something in class, I'm like a Massey, and all of the students go, <laughs> and I realized that I was said, you know, the equivalent of Stein the Cries or something like that. Um, but I'm never quite sure what the word is because Kiwis are very polite. <laughs> but, um, uh, so, as, as Colin has, has said, um, Jean, Jean swears a lot. There's a little bit of salty language. I might, I might try to edit it out because we have children now over here. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, yeah she's, uh, she loves to swear. So we'll see how we go with my, with my on the fly editing. This is from chapter six. Um, so things are really starting to change uh, at this point. The, the pandemic, um, unlike this one, pretty much everybody gets sick. Um, it's, it spreads as quickly as this one and as viciously. But, and even though people, there's mask wearing and, and a, set, a certain isolation, and a lot of scenes early in the novel that, that do parallel, like planes are grounded, you know, things have really changed. But um, after a while, everyone really just gives up because they can talk to a lot of animals. So after that, the, you know, being seen can't just really uh, seem to be too important. 
But at this point in chapter six, Jean actually isn't sick yet, and not so secretly, she, she kind of wants to be sick. She wants to be the special one who can talk to animals, and she's a little bit perfect that other people have this ability, and she doesn't. Um, and she's waking up in the morning, and her granddaughter's staying over at her flat. She lives in the wildlife park, and she realizes that, that Kimberly, her granddaughter, has, has got, the, got zoo fever, has got this degree. In the morning, the heat soaks the curtains. The wrinkled up sheets we lie between a dam. On the pillow beside me, Kim opens her eyes and their dawn thin. Two roses sprouting on her little brown face. All the nights of the dingo's warning, something's coming, it's here. And now here it is in the body of my little darling. I pick her up and try to cuddle her like a baby. Kimberly, she's, she's about six years old. Kimberly wriggles from me and won't let me put drops in her flaming eyes. I examine my white moon face in the mirror, eyes still grey as a southern sky, but my nose is blocked, skin prickling with its own heat. Kimberly has pasted herself to the glass door of the kitchen, watching as Wallamina hops slow circles around the yard. I crouch down beside Kim. You know what she's saying, love? Kimberly stares at the wallaby. Wallamina circles tighter and tighter. Kim, is she saying, what's around the corner? What's around the corner? Kim turns her new eyes on me. The whites now pink. Black irises, a rosy sheen. No. What then, Kim boy? My phone rings. How is she, asks Ange. I swallow. She's sick. Angela chokes, can't talk. She's up and about, though, I say after a while. We'll have some Cocoa Pops. She seems okay. Bring her here. You may as well. Help the staff have it. I tug at a roll of toilet paper. Not me. Well, that's just great, isn't it? That's just great. She hangs up, then calls back to tell me I have to feed the animals in all the sections, except the aquarium and the bird forest. Everyone else is too sick to get animals. I feel sick. It could be the start of soup. The feeling of everything I wanted rushing at me like night birds, scratching, ripping, no joy. Once I get away from Kim and the staff and their red-eyed scowling, I feel a bit better. Freeze on my skin and wispy hair. The stink of leaves on poo, on piss, on fur. Something dead, something lively. The park is beautiful this way. My luck runs out when I get to the food store. Casey and Lou are there, out the back, gaping in slack-jawed wonder at the series of bedraggled cages on death row. And lose herself. <laughs> and just see them sitting cross-legged in the mark on the floor of one of the enclosures, staring at a spotted foal. The look on Casey's face like the rapture you see on one of those late night happy clappy God horror shows. Sort of TV my mum used to get into. Faces flung open, sore eyes widened, mouth gaping, gaping, drowning in glory. The quoll, it's a little very cute thing. <laughs> the quoll darts over to a branch, rubbing its red furry chin on the wood. Casey trails after, sniffing the branch, muttering, it's okay. She turns to Lou. How can I tell them it's okay? Why doesn't he? It's what they all think, Liu tells her. Think what, I call in. Liu blinks like she's forgotten how to be a real person. That we're predators. That every time we come near them, we're trying to eat them. I'm trying to tell them we're safe, but they don't get it. Or I don't get it. Because they're bodies. It's hard to... She turns away, pink eyes blinking. Why don't you tell them we're here to protect them from the wild beasties outside, I say. She acts like she can't hear me, goes back to murmuring. All around the yard there are cages filled with animals calling out and shuffling around. The squawk of a parrot with a bad wing, an olive python shifting in her sandy tank. A couple of little wallabies doing circuits around their enclosure. Casey and Lou twitch and frown, heads darting. They call out to those animals. Hi, hello, I'm Liu. What's your name? I don't have names, probably, I tell them. 
Why don't you ask them what it's like to be covered in fur? Or what it's like to fly? Or what or why they get tricked by food every time? That's what I'd ask. But I can't ask. Or I can, but I don't know if there's an answer. Hey, ask them, Jean. Yeah? With this in. It looks like two animal crazy Sheilas asking boring questions. Liu puts on her bitch face and goes across the yard to the parrot enclosure. Something on the ground pulls her up short. A long reptile tail, four stout legs, and a long ancient face. Liu starts laughing the way you laugh at a horror movie. A cackle that covers a scream. The lizard glowers at her through the top of its head. Casey peers out from the cold cage. Can you talk to it? The lizard doesn't move except for its heartbeat pumping behind its ears. Then it darts a thin pink tongue. Did you did you get that? Liu turns to us, pointing to the lizard. Starts her creepy laughter up again. He can taste me. It's like I'm deadly salt. I'm poison. He says he... She goes back to staring. I'm just giving him a little nap. Inside the food store, it's quiet and empty. Cool metal prep tables in the snot coloured dim. My body has sucked all the heat from the day to radiate it back out through the slash in my messed up hand. Expect steam when I wash the burnless skin and see. The water hurts my face and I shiver now, freezing. Drag the cauldron jacket on and collapse onto the gurney we used to examine the sick beasts. I'm there like a bat with her wings clutched, my ancient fingers grabbing the air. The shivers pass again into heat, then cold again, but not as bad. After the next flush, I feel good enough to sit up and take the jacket off, wet with sweat. A spider sits slay-legged in the corner, watching a fat blood fly do wheelies through the air. Someone runs past the food store with a sound that is half laugh, half cry. I snort my nose on a bit of paper towel and the room smells stinks like antiseptic, hay, rotten fruit and mice. The feed in the buckets is waiting to be dished out, half rotten fruit that needs to be used today when it's gone. It's just you now, Jeannie Queen, I tell myself, edging off the gurney, legs steady. Business as usual. Whistle through my teeth like some cartoon rooster, rooster reeling around the food store, saving the day. Keep my sore hand out of the way and go at it one handed. Kibble in my pocket for bribes and treats. Get going on the mouse feed, the grains, the seeds, the pellets. Whispering. There must be Doug talking to his baby in the room. I've got real work to do. I grab a couple of soft apples and dice them up wonkily with a big dirty knife on the chopping board, stained with fruit from yesterday or the day before. No time for cleaning. The voices grow louder but muffled. I'm busy in here, I shout. I give the bucket a mix with my hand. I can't hear you. The voices stop. Start up again. A yellow mist, a sickly gas, seeps from behind the swing door that leads to the hall, the mouse rooms, and the gas chamber. The pipes must be busted, the gas left on. It curls like clouds, leaving poison under the door. If it kills those mice, we'll be buggered. Nothing to feed the snakes with the rat claws. I dump my bucket, grab a, cup, a gulp of fresh air, and launch through the doors, beating at the off switch with my grimy hand. It's already off. No gas. Gas. Wisps from the mouse room. It must have leaked in there. All the breeding hairs will be dead. The whispers louder. I can almost make out words. Hello? The gas is thick. They'll all be dead. I haul open the heavy doors to see if I can save even a couple of the mice. Dozens of them sit up on their haunches, alive, horrified. Gas rising not from the pipes but from their bodies. Not squeaking, screaming. They scream bloody murder, the death of everyone. Death in the cages and death in the walls. My poor old dad reaches out from his early grave. Disease eats my face, crunches my bones until I'm rotting, empty, sucked by rat claws, bones left to dust. I fall back, fumbling. What's left of my body? Blood and bits, a carcass, but I'm whole. The mice are whole. I'm going crazy. There's no screaming, just a whole bunch of fat ass mice with their noses in the air. Run. Ah. 
I look around. Someone has said it. Clear as speech. I'm in here. I call out to Doug or someone. Run. It's glands from the body. It's crops and uh, killing and shelter. No, it's who's talking? It's just Jean. The small white bodies in the cages shiver. Gases rise off them and a squeak comes out and together they make run. On a hillside, run to the ball. You go, I'll make my way one and everyone, everything, the body, run. I run. We have some time for questions. I'll let you can direct traffic yeah, as you sure. pop up your hands. Um, questions for the author. Oh, I guess at what, at what point did you know where, where, where it was all finally going? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess I guess it was once I found that character, Gene, but also when I, I, I got, it was actually a writer's rhythm up at the wildlife park in the Northern Territory. Um, and as I said before, they would be set on a park and I don't, in a farm. And I went up to the, there and I was living in a caravan underneath the ranger's house. And um, there, were, there were all these enclosed animals, but there were also a lot of wild animals. And every day between 2 and 4 p.m., this giant olive python would come and sort of block my entrance to the bathroom. So I couldn't actually <laughs> get to the bathroom every day. I, was just, I just had to wait for her to sort of move on because the sun would come. And an ankle that at that time of day. And I'm living in this incredible place with, you know, the most extraordinary animals, wild and enclosed, I've ever seen, and quite a beautiful environment as well. So outside the park, it was quite rough, and there were a lot of hunters, and the roads were, you know, very sort of bare landscapes. And it was a tropical paradise in this park, and I thought, what better place to start a novel? You know, this is, um, you know, this is much better than I could ever imagine. So then I started spending time just documenting um, the different pathways through the forest and the different enclosures. I would write down smells, I would collect leaves, I would record the sounds of the dingoes, the sounds of the barking owls hoofing overhead, and I just collected everything. And once I had that, I knew that it was sort of a road story that eventually Jean and this dingo, I had this image of them, of Jean and this dingo being on a road together. I knew I was going there, but I guess I didn't have my and, and once I would, had found that wildlife park, I really knew where the novel went and then where it was going. Um, because often, I'm, and sometimes I talk to students, and I'm interested in how people see stories, like how do you, how do people get ideas, and I'm interested that, that a lot of students will often answer that they um, will think of a line, like they'll, they'll think of actual words, or they'll hear something, or they'll get a feeling, an emotion, but for me, and I think maybe it was like, I studied photography way back in the 90s, or, or maybe I'm quite a visual person. For me, it's a, an image, like I have a very, very clear image in my head. And it's sort of my job to get to that point and make that image move. And so I had this clear image of, of this woman and a dingo on a road together. And, and that's sort of this, you know, logical feeling. And I had, it took me a long time to work out how to get to that point. But I knew where I was going always from the very beginning. I just didn't know how I was going to start or get all the way there. <laughs> See, you covered everything, Colin. <laughs> Is it quite common? Com you said a writer's residency at a wildlife park. Do does that wildlife park always offer a writer's residency? <laughs> yeah, they do. do they they really? have an artist. They have. Yeah, they usually have artists in residence. Wow. Oh, I don't know that they've, they've had that many writers. So usually people do amazing work up there. There was Stop. one they have? <laughs> you ask people. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm wondering who they like have. Podcasting. <laughs> um, they often have people from the territory. There was an amazing artist there at the same time. She wasn't living there. I don't think it's normal for people. Because I was from Victoria, I was like, oh, great, I'll just come up and live there. And, they, and I'll bring a caravan. They said, okay. Yeah. But I think normally people are from the territory. There was an amazing woman who um, was collecting rubbish from the ocean and then making sea creatures out of the plastic bag and the rubbish that she found. Um, 
I mean, that's quite a tense thing to do because in Darwin, the oceans are filled with crocodiles. So, I, yeah, I, I didn't ever ask her how she actually got to the rubbish past the crocodiles. There's a terrific scene in the in the book with crocodile with a crocodile. In it. Go ahead, please. Um, oh, did you? So when you were looking at the um, wildlife people, did you kind of get to know the other staff that were there and some of the other characters, like how did they sort of loosely based around some of those people? Yeah. And was it a transient kind of staff environment like people coming from overseas to be there? The, the question is about the when she was at the wildlife residency, um, did she get to know the other staff and how many of those make a presence in the book? Mm. Um, that's a, such a great question. Yeah, I guess I was living because a lot of the staff actually live there um, in and the the houses that Jean lives, lives in are, are quite similar to those houses that they stay in as well. Um, and the park, there were some international people. It was often it seemed to be pretty much run by these really tough women, and I mean they were they were some of the toughest people I have ever met. The woman whose house I was living under, she was a woman in her 30s and she was a ranger and um, she was a reptile specialist so you know she would work with all of the snakes and the and the um, lizards and the crocodiles in the park and then on the weekends she would go out crocodile tag which is when you go and find crocodiles and actually put something on them so that they can be identified um, you know so that you can keep track of them and also so that when they inevitably eat someone because someone always gets eaten in the territory while i was there i was there for i think three or four months and two people were eaten and that and it just happened um you know so she was just a crocodile she was like crocodile one day <laughs> um and there was another woman there who was basically a bird of prey expert um she nearly had her eye taken out by a sea eagle and you know, I was I, I interviewed a lot of the range as well. I was up there just to get their perspective on the human animal experience. And I said, you know, tell me about this sea eagle nearly taking your eye out. She said, Oh, it was totally my fault. Sea eagles just need a lot of space, you know. Um, you know, with the other birds of prey, like they like to be cuddled, you know, but the sea eagle, I'd done the wrong thing and we were in the middle of a show, like in front of an audience, and the sea eagle just came down and just went got out this giant tail, tail and, just went, and she said the sea eagle didn't mean to miss it was a warning so, so with that talent there's a scene in the book um, that, where that happens um, with that talent she said the sea eagle was saying you did the wrong thing by me and i'm just letting you know that i can take your eye that's an anthropomorphizing you know that's anthropomorphizing but she works with these creatures and she thinks that that's what just happened um, so in a way, I guess they, just like that chimpanzee in Florida, I guess they sort of really influence that, um, that human experience, uh, but not in the way that you would expect, like there's not much direct dialogue, I didn't really base um, anyone's looks on particular people. Um, but there would be, and that's the wonderful thing about getting the experience to immerse yourself in a writer's residence, especially in a place like this wildlife park in the northern territory. But then just these gorgeous movements, like the way that a, um, a ranger would reach behind them and take out their walking talk in a really casual way, like a tough cop, like just this. <laughs> um, the way that they call the animals critters, the way that someone would just go over to a kangaroo or really a, a wallaby or a wallaroo or just like a cross between and just pick them up by their tail and just say, oh yeah, no, they don't mind. It's just sort of the way you carry them around because otherwise they kick you in the face, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> this creature <goes. laughs> So this beautiful um, and quite weird actions were from what I, I took um, almost directly, if not characterizing it. It sounds like there are many more animals in Australia than in New Zealand that will kick you in the face or perhaps eat you. <laughs> Do you think that's perhaps why the idea came to you that maybe they had more to say and maybe we weren't listening and that, like I'll eat you if you don't just listen? Like, I don't know. Would it, would it have come to you if the New Zealand are like yeah, I mean, I wonder about that too. I mean, the bird, bird life and sea life is overwhelmingly um, In a way, I think we have a similar sort of bird, bird life, even though New Zealand is known for its birds. 
Less bitey, though, maybe? Or? Less bitey. <laughs> yeah. Less bitey. The seals could really give you a lot of money. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah um, I, I, I've been wondering about um, our national relationship with sort of land and animals on the, on the different um, landscapes and, and countries. When you go for a walk in the Australian bush, you're always looking down and listening. Very carefully, because one of the most wonderful things about it is that you're probably going to see a kenna or a, or a kangaroo or what, 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 you know, suddenly you look up and this thing is just like, if it's a kangaroo, like staring at you, or there's an echidna frozen. So, and you're also always listening out for snakes. Um, so, there's a constant, and you get to know the different muscles. So, you're really looking down. In New Zealand, I feel like you're often looking up and listening up. And I wonder what that does to the national identity, and I wonder what it would do to a book. Um, if you were really looking at um, the sensory experience of relating to animals, would you sort of have an upward focus? Uh, yeah, so I, don't, I haven't written, uh, I've written some poetry set in New Zealand, but I haven't really written a story here yet, so if it was an animal-based story, I wonder what that would do to the actual texture process. Because I feel like birds, you know, if you don't have a bird trapped in your house, you know, you're yelling at them, go out the door, go out the door, <laughs> and they're like, up, up, you know, and they, and they want to go that way, so uh, are you a sort of upward thinking nation? I don't know, like, do you, are we more influenced by our environment that allows us to realise, yeah, stop and listen to that? <clears throat> yeah. Australia is a really those animals are really scary. <laughs> and that's another thing as well, um, that I'm I'm not I'm not one of those I realized um, how how cowardly I, I am when I went to that wildlife park and saw and met these tough, tough women who were, you know, wrangling crocodiles on the weekend. I'm actually quite scared of, of other animals. Like I but partly it's a respect thing as well. I do really, really respect their power. I don't want to go up and touch them and prod them and make them move and, and do things. I want to you know, watch them from a distance. And I don't necessarily want to get too many of them. Even little dogs, you know, they, they can do really... <laughs> yeah. um, I really enjoyed your uh, talk. I wanted to ask uh, one question, which is I'm originally from India. And, uh, and as you're probably aware, we have very varied wildlife as well. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about was that in particularly rural India, uh, both rural people and Aboriginal people have, you know, they've, they've lived alongside this extraordinary wildlife for millennia and have many forms of relationships with it, including as deities, you know, as, as gods and goddesses, uh, which is also anthropomorphic, but not just. They, they also respect them for their unique spirits. And I was, I was wondering about similar, whether there are similar sorts of relationships, particularly between Aboriginal peoples in Australia and the immediate wildlife around them. And were, were there lots of kind of deity-like figures for them and with whom they communicated and uh, and prayed to or, or received strength from? Um, I was, I'm just, I'm just trying to get the name because in Australia there's, um, Australia is, and, and part, part of the reason for the name of this novel in a way, the country, Australia is made up of about 250 indigenous countries, it's not one country, so a lot of people sort of say this place we now call Australia because of course there's incredible um, heritage here. So I'm just looking up, um, oh yeah, so I was um, talking with uh, Larakia elders who are the elders of this wildlife park um, and and they gave me a real ticking off deservedly because I hadn't come to them first, um, so I should have gone, because I'm you know, a, a, a colonial Australian, so I should have gone to them first. And said, you know, can I, you know, can I be on this country? Um, and I did it. So I got a good service from them. But there were these wonderful women, and they took me for a walk through the wildlife park because it is their traditional land. I hope I'm okay to tell this story. I think I am because um, because they were telling it to me and, and a wider audience. But there are many, many stories in the indigenous culture that 
by the commission um, related to no even uh, that she had access to. But um, she, uh, one of the women, um, uh, Rena, uh, said, Oh, you see that, that golden orb spider there? So I'm not sure if you have golden orbs here, but outside they're very beautiful. Um, but they sort of, <laughs> they sort of like this oh, on their web, and they really and have these gorgeous sort of golden legs and these giant webs, and very magnificent to see. And she said, Oh, you see that golden orb spider there? And I was like, Oh, yes. And she said, That's my mother. And then just paused. And she said, you don't know what I mean, do you? <laughs> and I said, not really. <laughs> and, and she said, this is this is my relationship. Because she knew I was writing a book about animals and I'd been interviewing her about her relationship with our animals. And she said, this is, what, this is my relationship with the country and this is my relationship with animals in this, in this country. Um, you know, I, um, yeah, that was my response. Even though, um, the golden orb spider isn't the, isn't the some I suppose you would call it a totem animal to the place. Um, that's actually the crocodile. Um, so people are not cute. People um, wouldn't eat the crocodile. Um, we cut the crocodile. Yes, so we don't touch. And yet the spider was her mother. And so um, that was one of those moments, you know, when that um, very sort of limited colonial brain just went, <laughs> you know. And I was, I was so grateful for that sharing of, of knowledge. Um, even though there was so much more that I didn't think of next month. So, yeah, it's such a I mean, There are places in Australia where I've been, um, and you know, someone who's guiding us will, will point. Um, this is actually Mungo National Park, where you might know Mungo Man. Mungo Man was found, it was like one of the most sort of ancient preserved um, uh, people, and there's also Mungo Woman. I was in Mungo National Park, and the guide said, Oh, I um, see those shells there. 25,000 years ago, um, my relatives were sitting there, um, you know, eating some shellfish. We're in the middle of this desert. And so this was a place of, of, that used to be a great lake, um, you know, this sort of you know, family sitting there having dinner. And 25,000 years ago, my relatives were sitting there to be able to say that. So the, yeah, you're right, the relationship, um, and I'm sure that the, um, but in India, it's the same way the relationship is deep, right? And deeply spiritual. Thank you. How are we doing? <laughs> Five minutes left. Do one more question or let you go later? I can see one of my animals in here. <laughs> <laughs> Team coffee break? Coffee break? Yeah, do you have any I don't know. I'm, I'm amazed by the. I want to make sure I understand because you're talking about the animal songs. You wrote animal words in English and put them in Google Translate to a different language and then translated them there and then copy and pasted and translated that back to English and they gave you something different. That's right. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a really, really fun I'm gonna go way play to, with that. to make poetry. Yeah, yeah. try it. Try it. Latin. Or, or Latin or Finnish. Yeah, Finnish. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, um, thank you so much for this talk, Laura. It's been really just a pleasure to get, uh, get to know the story better. Oh, thank you so much, Colin, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming, you know, on a Saturday morning, you know, to come out and, and hear a talk. It's really just so, yeah, kind that you're so supportive of, of arts in this amazing, in the amazing Manawatu, um, which I'm just starting to get to know. It's, and it's generous of you to come and see me. Yeah. Fairly recently we arrived to um, the last welcome. Thank you. Um, if you do want a copy of the book, I do have some here. Um, I think they're at 37. Well, first of all, I should say please support your bookshop. Bruce McKenzie has been really, really supportive there, of course, in Palmerston North. Um, there's a lot of really cool shops around who are selling it. Um, I also have them here for a little bit cheaper. Um, a couple of copies. Um, oh, and if it's not... I assume you library, but if you if you go to a library, um, you know, and a book you love is there, do order it because it really it really benefits us. Um, you know, uh, people sometimes say, oh, "I'm sorry, I got your book out from the library." No, that's that's encouraged. Um, libraries are the best supporters of anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.
It's a little co fi. Yeah. Oh, wow. it's great. Oh, yeah. it's not a yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, excellent. And you would do that Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Did we cross paths? Um, at some point, we yeah. probably uh, maybe. Okay. Okay. I've only been here in the last one year and change. So my area is um, actually storytelling on podcasts. It's so audio storytelling, radio storytelling. That's good. Very good. Did you let me ask So that's what I'm going to what, what's your area? Well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it would have just been any kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I'm a big lover of the bard. Thank you. 